Derbashnyuk y Yuri a medida que los smartphones agregan nuevos módulos y se vuelven cada vez más complejos, la superficie de ataque se agranda. Es así como en esta charla nos mostrarán las superficies de ataque que exploraron en smartphones basados en arquitectura ARM modernas, usando como base los Google Nexus 5X, Nexus 6P y Pixel. Alex Bashnuk es un investigador de seguridad independiente. Previamente fue miembro de los grupos de investigación de las amenazas avanzadas y del Centro de Seguridad de Excelencia en Intel e Intel Security. Sus intereses primarios son la seguridad y la explotación de hardware y firmware en plataformas de bajo nivel. Hello. Can you hear me, guys? Last row. Can I get clicker to switch the slides? Okay. I have nice clicker like this. That's pretty cool clicker. Anyway. My name is Alex, and I think I will present like this, not piano, but anyway. Um, I am today to present Blue Pill for your phone. Uh, the work was done uh, by two people, myself and Yuri. Uh, Yuri couldn't make here today, so I'll present myself. Um, before I will start, I just want to say thank you to the organizers of Echo Party to having me here, and it's a really great conference. Actually, clicker doesn't work. Can we fix it somehow? Okay, probably. Okay, I need to be closed from the from the to the computer. Okay. Anyway, um, some of you who may track our work previously uh, may ask what this guy is presenting today. And usually we are presenting about x86 uh, architecture, about x86 firmware uh, or platform um, uh, stuff like uh, in uh, ConsecWest we presented the Chipsec tool, which is running a lot of different things in the x86 system. But this talk is fully about ARM system. And there will be a story uh, how we started our investigation in ARM system, what kind of vector attacks we found, what kind of... Uh, uh, Pfizer's we built, and eventually what kind of the uh, full attack scenario we built at um, uh, in the end of the in the end of the presentation as a result of our research. Uh, so um, there will be a bucket related to reverse engineering, uh, basically how we figure out where is the entry point, who is handling input, and so on. There will be um, uh, the example of the Pfizer's, and then there will be the exploit demo. So, uh, about motivation. Uh, when we make a, a lot of stuff in x86, we figure out that there is a similar vector attacks for ARM system and x86 system, say poison pointer bugs. Uh, the, the bug is basically when you take the pointer, you pass the pointer from more privileges level, and that privileges, privil the, pri the code from privilege level just write to the address without checking that uh, the address is outside of the privilege ranges. And that was the case for the SMM. And then we, we, we just take a look and see that similar vector uh, was applicable for the ARM, uh, for the trust zone, for exploitation trust zone. And then we were thinking, okay, if this vector is similar, maybe there is small vectors we can discover, which is also similar for ARM as in 66, and we can explore them, fast them, and find the, the, the vulnerabilities. And also we wanted to check the similarity, like how does the architecture is similar in perspective of the security. That was our motivation, basically. A um, couple words about um, uh, what is uh, hypervisor-based rootkit. So in the classical system, you have the VMs, and the VMs should be isolated from each other, and they should be isolated from the hypervisor, sort of uh, it managing uh, all these VMs. Um, 
This is how this picture looks like with perspective of virtualization. Uh, if we don't have hypervisor, we have, we have just one system, there is application and there is a kernel. But with hypervisor, we can have uh, different VMs and this VMs isolated in the hardware perspective, meaning paging. So each VM has their own uh, isolated um, pages in the, in the physical memory and also uh, in the perspective of the hardware. So when, when the code is running in a, in a VM, uh, it cannot uh, take access or execute any privileged instruction which is just hypervisor can do. And hypervisor configuring what kind of events and what kind of interrupts uh, the VM uh, may send and how does it supposed to be emulated. And in the perspective for the attacker, uh, if the attacker has the kernel privileges, he can uh, try to compromise the hypervisor if there is some methods to do, and then if, if it happens, he can, he can install the rootkit in the hypervisor level in a, in a, in a way that it can be stealth, and it, can, it may interrupt uh, all of the sensitive requests and, and send the fake data. The story about uh, rootkits was uh, started in 2006 in x86 architecture. There was um, there was huge deal at that days. Uh, there was a couple of publications including uh, Dino Daisovi, uh, hardware virtualization rootkits, and Joanna Rutkowska Blue Pill. Um, when they demonstrated how uh, this concept is working in x86, so basically you compromise the hypervisor and then you interrupting all of the uh, interfaces necessary to emulate uh, the hardware behavior and make the stealth uh, code which is running under operation system uh, and controlling the system. So in 2015 we uh, demonstrated that there is a lot of interesting aspects related to, uh, to the hardware. So basically if hypervisor not configuring correctly hardware and allowing some interfaces uh, from uh, or hardware interfaces uh, be accessible to the VM, that VM may use that interfaces to make a privilege escalation uh, to the hypervisor or to make some confused deputy attacks. So uh, that's really important when you uh, build a hypervisor, make sure that all of the VM is fully isolated and you didn't provide any access to any of the hardware and firmware resources. Even for the, uh, for the management VM, say for Windows 10 uh, uh, VSM technology, uh, the root partition has access to the uh, firmware interfaces which can be used to exploit um, and run code to, in a hypervisor in compromised uh, VSM technology. So a little bit about ARM uh, in general. So there is a normal world and secure world, and they, uh, they basically is related in the hardware perspective, meaning that uh, every time when transaction to the memory go, it has a source and destination, and the memory controller checking that, the, that the, if the, is this transaction coming from normal world to secure world, they drop it, the transaction. If this transaction coming from secure world uh, to secure world, then it passes. So basically kind of rules when normal world don't have access to anything related to the secure world inside the memory, and including the devices. So there is a devices uh, which is accessible just for secure world and not accessible for the normal world. Also, there is a mixed devices, which has partially accessible from the normal world and partially accessible for secure, secure world, sort of mixed devices. Um, all of these devices is like SOC specific, so whoever developing SOC, they define it in a, in a level of the memory controller, how does transaction should go and which of the transactions should, should pass or not pass. And if there is any mistake in that level, it can be also security hole. Um, a little bit about privileges level in ARM uh, system. ARM v7 system has um, uh, a little bit different architecture uh, than ARM v8. Uh, v7 is a little bit uh, system when in a normal world you have uh, privileges level, privilege level zero application, um, privilege one kernel, uh, privilege level one kernel, um, basically, this is the normal um, system, and there is isolation for the application, and there is interface, as we see interface, to talk to the kernel. Then we have a hypervisor, hypervisor running in PL2, uh, and the hypervisor is supposed to make an isolation uh, for the kernel and protect itself to, to make integrity of the hypervisor, do not, to make that kernel couldn't compromise the hypervisor. 
This is the normal world. And also their secure world or trust zone area. In trust zone area, uh, we see trustlets. This is the um, uh, trusted application which is running inside the secure world. And there is a secure kernel and secure monitor, which is basically sort of mini operation system which is necessary to have to support the trustlets to run and to support interfaces from the normal world to the secure world. Interestingly, that trustlets in some system can be loaded dynamically, meaning that secure kernels should support all of the functionality to verify dynamically a trustlet and load the trustlet to the, trustlet, to the uh, secure memory, uh, which is uh, kind of uh, a lot of functionality and can be a good, source, good, good, uh, good attack vector. Uh, then also, uh, secure kernel support uh, uh, SMC uh, handlers or SMC services. They're basically some functionality which is necessary uh, f uh, to have to allow Trustlex, for example, talk to the hardware or handle some requests from normal world. Say normal world ask some, uh, encrypt some data or decrypt some data or some um, random number. Uh, th th this request uh, go through SMC, this is software interrupt uh, from the normal world to the secure world. Then uh, when it came to the SMC, SMC decide who, who's supposed to handle this, neither the secure kernel or some of the trustlets, and then it redirect the request to the specific entity who should handle the request. Um, th that's, um, in, a, in a RMV7, uh, the secure kernel and secure monitor in sort of one uh, privilege level, there is no hardware separation there. But in uh, eight, uh, ARMv8, there is um, uh, the specifically hardware separation between secure kernel and secure monitor. So if you compromise secure kernel, but you want to fully own the system, you, you still need to compromise secure monitor. This is an interesting point because inside the secure, uh, secure uh, world, you have the boundaries, but because um, they all inside sort of one area, there is uh, more attack vectors between trustlet and secure kernel than, for example, from the kernel to the secure monitor. Uh, and in this case, if you, if you compromise trustlet, 99% uh, you will own all of the system because the stack there is, is more vulnerable than interfaces outside. Um, and there was an interesting vulnerability found by um, Galbini and Mini from Project Zero when you can basically load vulnerable trustlet. So nowadays you can load vulnerable translate, uh, compromise the translate, and then make a privilege escalation to entire stack uh, um, to, own, uh, to own the system. So uh, we know about that privileges levels, uh, but how, how does the communication work? And communication goes through calling convention. And calling convention done through general purpose registers for, uh, for um, a trust zone interface and for hypervisor interface. When the, in general purpose register X1, we pass in the SMC ID, basically what service we want to call, the ID of the service, SMC service. And then we pass in the rest of the parameter from X1 to X6, or how many parameters we need to pass. This is the, the calling convention uh, as a standard. But the vendor uh, may implement the, this um, uh, specifically for the platform, and we will see that it is a little bit different in implementation perspective. As I already mentioned a couple of times, isolation, isolation, but how does the isolation work? In the perspective of the memory, isolation works through the paging. So paging, making isolation so the VM couldn't access, for example, hypervisor. And in this case, we have two levels of translation, really similar in x86. We have stage one, which is translating virtual address to intermediate physical address or guest physical address. And then from the guest physical address, we translate into the real physical address through VTDBR register. So the interest, this is really important because uh, the vulnerability, which I will explain later, will be related that some of the hypervisor didn't enable stage two translation. And in this case, if it didn't enable stage, uh, stage two translation, you allow and automatically the guest have the direct access to entire physical memory. And then uh, from there, uh, you can find the hypervisor and modify it and blue pill it to install in their implant or rootkit inside your hypervisor. Um, there is our lab equipment, which we tested. So there was um, Google Nexus 5, uh, uh, RMV7, 32-bit, not really interesting. Uh, the main target was Google Nexus 5X and 6P, which is the main target for this talk. And there is a Google Pixel, uh, which is not vulnerable to this vulnerability, and we will show why. Um, for uh, The interesting part is um, 
uh, Google Pixel has already 64-bit version of the uh, TrustZone kernel, uh, which is different because previous generation has 32-bit version of TrustZone kernel. So that is kind of first generation uh, or when they created a movie to new architecture. So that may be also source of uh, interesting vectors. Maybe some of the um, 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 type confusion attacks or something like this. As I already uh, mentioned about a little bit about ARM, uh, let me just uh, give you a brief um, 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 comparison between x86 and ARM in perspective of security and perspective of this specific presentation. For, uh, so, a root of trust. In ARM, it is really static, uh, done from the ROM uh, uh, up to the kernel and allowing the OEM to make unlocks. So you may, you may, uh, you may allow someone to run um, unsigned code after the ROM using the special fuses. Um, the, root, the root of trust there is really strict, restricted and really good design. So basically it is really hard uh, to say if, some, if OEM didn't unlock the phone and you want to do this, it's really hard because you need to make a privilege to the a privilege escalation to trust zone. And then also the hardware should support the access from trust zone to that fuses and then you can unlock the system. That's pretty, pretty complicated. So in x86 there was different uh, philosophy because the system, the ecosystem is more open. Uh, there is multiple generation, didn't exist any uh, good root of trust from the ROM. But from Haswell there was a technology, BootGuard, which is basically creating the root of trust from the CPU um, up, to the, up to the OS. And um, it, it done, uh, it basically sort of similar to what we have in ARM, but more flexible, you can run it in, uh, uh, in any laptop and not, not you, OEM can run it and support different modes there. So in perspective of the TE, uh, trusted execution environment, uh, ARM has really flexible uh, uh, secure world, as I already mentioned a couple times. They have different privileges level, uh, isolation between levels, uh, secure devices, uh, pretty solid designed uh, TE environment when you can run uh, your trustlet safely. In x86, there was a mix of different technologies. Uh, one of them was SMM, but, but SMM was not designed for the TE. It was designed to support some hardware feature in a software perspective. And then later on, to make SMM more flexible, there was released a technology STM, which is making uh, privileges level inside the SMM. And, but that was also not designed for create a TE. It was not popular. And then there was a couple solutions which is used virtualization based technology uh, for create a TE, like uh, I already mentioned Windows 10 VSM. But when you use virtualization based technology uh, to create, um, um, when you use it virtualization technology uh, for security, you need to be really careful what kind of interfaces you're allowing uh, to take access to. Uh, and then in, in perspective of the virtualization, ARM implement the, uh, the hypervisor as an exception level meaning that there is not flexibility inside the level. They're just a single uh, sort of privileged level, but they call it exception level. And in, in x86, uh, virtualization is context switch technology, meaning that when you're switching from the guest to the hypervisor, you're switching the entire context of the CPU, meaning that inside the hypervisor, you also have the privileges level. And inside the guest, you have privileges level. This is allowing you much better flexibility uh, to build a technology on top of the virtualization in x86. Um, to understand better security, we need to understand how the system is boots, uh, what kind of um, uh, component we have, and uh, where is the attack vectors, where is the, where is the time when we um, set the con security configuration, so on. And usually uh, every system uh, has the two phases uh, during the boot time. One is um, a read-only phase and one is read-write. Read-only is some uh, really small piece of code which is uh, building in a chip, uh, in something called an AC mem memory, uh, on chip memory, and that code is verifying next step, and then uh, calling the next step, which can be read-write. This will allow the, the OEM flexibly uh, rewrite read-write code, but uh, still have a good security channel uh, to build it from the ROM memory. So when, this, when the phone is powering on, uh, in example of uh, um, Qualcomm Snapdragon 810, you have uh, RPM code first run, and RPM is resource power management code, and the ROM from there, just powering on the, the main application CPU, 
and, and switching the execution to the main application CPU for, for the ROM of that CPU, to the ROM, mem ROM code. The ROM code in the main CPU, uh, APSS, uh, basically loads the SBL, a second, a secondary bootloader, and then trigger the secondary bootloader. That's, that's the, uh, the main uh, phase for the uh, just read-only memory. Then it's, it switched the control to read-write memory. So here, from here, the, uh, everything exists already in a regular memory after the memory was trained and, uh, and then you can access to that memory. So if in this early stage you, you may send a DMI transaction, that this is also possible attack scenario when you kind of try to interrupt uh, somewhere really early uh, in the boot flow. Uh, although um, DMI be not enabled at that moment and the transaction will not pass through, this is something interesting to check in. Uh, so what this SBL code is doing is basically uh, loading the secure, uh, secure monitor, verifying and loading secure monitor. And then secure monitor verifying and loading the rest of the secure, uh, secure world. Uh, by this point, there is, uh, there is still uh, an old code which is running, just secure, secure code. There is uh, non-secure, there's still zero code running which is uh, unsecure. So when the, all of the security configuration is set and, and trust zone kernel is set and trust zone trust lets everything set, uh, everything locked, then the, there is the first time when some unsecure code is start executing. And first unsecure code was EL2 hypervisor. So then hypervisor initialized the rest of the system. But as you can see, uh, until the, until the uh, trust zone set, uh, we don't run any hypervisor or any normal world code. So as I already mentioned, there is a, a way to lock the system. And also, um, uh, as I already mentioned, we have the boot flow when the, everything is set uh, in a security perspective and, and then we run the hypervisor code. So now we want to go and start reverse engineering. Where we should start? So the easiest way to, to find the trust zone image is just download the factory image, the image which is using to the sort of flash uh, entire system, entire phone, and then extract it from factory image. And there is a tool from Gal uh, Benjamini, unpack uh, bootloader image, which you can use and extract the, uh, the binaries. And one of the binaries called is TZ, trust zone. So then you can load this in IDA and see the sections. And as you can see, there is a section for Trazon kernel and the section for Trazon monitor. So now, from here, you can start reverse engineering the code and find the entry points, who is the handling it, and find the vulnerabilities. You can also see there is a bunch of other codes, like hypervisor uh, binary is also here, RPM, RPM code is also here, SBL1 code is also here. So you have plenty of materials to, to make the analysis. And we will focus on Trazon and the hypervisor in this presentation. Also, you want to have the dynamic environment. Dynamic environment, you want to root the phone, you want to install your own driver, and you want to run existing tools uh, to start sort of investigation and, and playing with the raw hammer attacks, caching attacks, you may want to use for incident response. There is a bunch of tools which you already can start playing with to, to make you better understand the architecture and what attack scenario is possible. So now, coming back to the reverse engineering. So you, you, kind of, you sort of load binaries, but you don't know where to take a look. So the one, is, one of the simplest way to start is just take a look on the open source implementation of the trust zone. And there is really good open source implementation reference implementation of the, of the uh, trust zone from the ARM, um, which you can find in the GitHub. They, they are having the implementation of all of the early phases. So you can go from there and see what kind of register is set, what kind of flow look like, and so on and so forth. It's really helpful to you, then you will match it in the, in, the, in the binary and you will find the similar pieces, and then from there you can find entry points. And there is a couple other implementation of Trust Zone as well. Okay, uh, and where we should start after we load the binaries? First of all, we want to analyze Trust Zone Monitor because Trust Zone Monitor is the most privileged code. And the event is coming to this mode uh, before it redirecting to, to uh, Secure Kernel, for example. And we should start with uh, VBAR EL3. Uh, this is the register which is pointing on the uh, vector table. And the vector table is basically a table which is uh, collecting all of the exception handlers, default exception handlers. So anytime when someone triggers event, uh, and this code suppose, uh, and uh, this privilege level supposed to execute, it starts from this table. 
because this table contain all of the default handlers. And then from here, you can see, okay, uh, if there is SMC um, event happen, and from, say, from unprivileged mode, you will see with offset 4,000, with offset 4,000, you will see here the, the, the handler for the SMC um, events, for the SMC interrupts. So every time a normal world uh, 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 want to talk to the trust zone, code is start, uh, code came here, and from here, uh, the, the, the secure monitor decide where to redirect request. Neither to secure kernel or just drop the request. So this is the entry point. Now you want to find the, the methods which is redirecting to the uh, secure kernel and find the secure kernel code. Uh, here you can use the same logic. You basically find a vbar el1 exception um, uh, vector table, and in this vector table you find all of the handlers for all of the events, and then from here you can find SMC handler, and from here you can go and find SMC default handler, and then you find specific handler for services. So all of the services which I was mentioned previously implemented uh, SN, SMC handlers in a secure kernel. For 32-bit system, uh, a similar story but different register and different table, but pretty similar what, what we have. So then, uh, after you find the default SMC default handler and you find the, uh, how does it handle the arguments, uh, you want to verify is this calling convention which you saw in the standard exactly the same as in the binary. There is two ways to do this. You may reverse engineer a lot and find all of the functions which is handling the input, or you can just take a look at open source implementation for the trust zone driver, the driver which is supposed to talk to the trust zone. And you figure out, okay, there is a couple different calling convention and how the arguments is, is storing. And you will see, uh, for RMV8 uh, uh, Qualcomm trust zones, the, the calling convention look like this. If you have less than five argument, the, the, all of the argument passes through general purpose register. And X, X0 is handler ID, basically what kind of SMC service you call. Uh, X1 um, um, represent uh, how many arguments and some mask, and then the list of the arguments. If you have more than five arguments, it's stored in a special buffer, and the pointer to that buffer stored in X5. Um, and uh, if you go and take a look in SMC default handler, you will see what the how does flow is going. So it checks that what kind, what type of event. Then it checks the x1 in a table um, in an SMC table. Then it checks um, x0 in SMC table to find the specific SMC handler. Then it checks x1 that making sure that the number of uh, arguments is passing correctly. And then it checks the argument. Uh, and after it makes all of the checks that basically call the dispatcher which will uh, call the specific SMC handler to handle this request. So uh, how does the check is working? So here is the example how does the check working for um, the um, extra arguments. So uh, to check the extra arguments, first of all, what happening is it checking that X5, the buffer for this argument, not overlapping with trust zone, meaning that this buffer outside of trust zone boundaries. Then it copy all of the arguments in, inside internal memory and check every D word. This is, uh, this is the method how they make sure that there is no race condition there. Uh, the check itself implemented uh, in a way that every two argument uh, taken uh, from the argument list, and uh, they, um, they assuming that one is address and another is size. And they check in each uh, pair of the arguments against the table when, you, when, this, when the trust zone memory address is stored. Basically, in this table, uh, trust zone define the addresses which are supposed to be protected. And then every two argument in comparing to all of the entrants in this table. This is the method how the trust zone verifying that when you pass the argument um, to the trust zone handlers, to the SMC handlers, you're not trying to um, overlap with trust zone. And if you try to overlap with trust zone, meaning you try to create a right primitive to the trust zone, they will, they will catch it and they will, and they will return the error. That, this is the method. Um, the SMC handler table you can find also from the SMC default handler when they check in the X0 parameter. You can find that there is a SMC table and from the SMC table you can find the, uh, the magic number, it's some number. Uh, SMC ID basically def uh, the, the one which is represent the service. Um, X2, uh, argument 2 is number of arguments, there is some flags and pointer to the SMC, um, SMC handler function. 
So that's basically how does the default handler call specific handler. So it, in going through this table, find the, uh, the SMC with this ID, taking the address of the, uh, of the function and calling this function. And this is like example of the typical SMC handler. Uh, what is interesting is we see here is right primitive. So it's calling the child function, and child function has a right primitive uh, uh, when it's right to x3. But as I, as I mentioned before, uh, if you pass the address of the trust zone, it will not go through because the previous check, they check that every argument is not overlapping with trust zone. Uh, in case if you have complicated structure, um, obviously default handler will not knew this, so the specific handler is responsible to check all of the addresses if they manipulate the complicated structure, which is another vector. Another interesting point, how you can discover what, what the SMC handler is doing is based on um, what kind of memory it's it using. And when it's using some memory of the devices, you can find it, and then you can kind of fill information about, okay, this is the random generator because it uses the random generator uh, device. And when you find this, you, you, you have a better idea of what the handler is doing. And another interesting um, uh, things which may help you after you run your Pfizer is uh, error code. Based on error code, you may figure out uh, where, where is inside the function, you, uh, you, what, what kind of flow you execute inside the function. And based on that, you may adjust your input, making sure that you get the, the, mask, the biggest coverage. And then you can uh, sort of create a blacklist for the error codes, making sure that this is error codes is not interesting and that one is interesting and so on and so forth. In perspective of the hypervisor, uh, we're using similar concept to, to make entire analysis. We start with vbar el2, uh, we find the vector table from the hypervisor, then we know all of the exception, default, uh, uh, exception table, uh, all of the default handlers. From there, we can uh, uh, figure out what is, uh, where, is the, uh, where is the function which is defining configuration of the hypervisor and so on, like uh, who is enabling uh, stage one translation and so on. Uh, now, as we know all of the architecture really well, let's, let's go and see what kind of attack vectors we may, we may explore. Uh, and as you can see, there is a bunch of different attack vectors you may have inside the trust zone and also from the outside, to the, uh, from the normal world to the trust zone. But there is also attack vectors from the kernel to the hypervisor. And then when you compromise the hypervisor, you can trap accesses to the secure world and emulate all of the behavior from there and spoof um, some requests to the, to the kernel and the user mode. Um, a bunch of actors uh, was um, explained really well uh, uh, from Project Zero, Gal Binyamini, really good work I recommend to check. So now uh, you need to sort of start analysis and check some vectors. And the one of the simplest way to do this is just read the MMIO ranges and see what kind of device is accessible, what kind of register is accessible, and so on. You're doing this for a couple of reasons. First, you're making sure that the secure device is not accessible. Second is when you find some um, non-zero value, you're checking, okay, maybe this is the address. And you want to find all of the addresses, a register which is containing the addresses. Uh, why this is so important? Because if you find the address, which is stored in, in somewhere in, a, in SOC or in core register, you may overlap this address with trust on memory and see how does memory control handle this request. It's supposed to check that uh, you overlap in sensitive register with the trust zone and, and drop the transaction. But, um, and, but we didn't investigate it too well to make sure that all of the cases is covered. That's a nice vector to take a look. Another one, DMA attack, um, really classical, uh, really popular, can be also applicable for the uh, trust zone memory in, 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 in early boot. Uh, didn't see example of that. Um, there was hardware attacks, but there is also software attacks which you can easily implement uh, in a software perspective, having just your own driver inside the, inside the kernel memory. So, and one of them is um, a classical one, uh, we call it poison pointer bug or um, Something like this. Uh, so the idea is you have the trust zone uh, memory somewhere inside the physical memory, which is protected by the hardware or by the memory controller. And the normal, uh, normally it operates like this. If the SMC handler want to uh, pass some address, it taking the address from the Android memory, from the regular, from the regular kernel memory, passing through to the SMC. SMC make uh, make some work and returning the buffer to that place. And this is the normally how does it operate. But 
attacker may to try to point the, uh, the address of the buffer back to the trust zone and try to write to the trust zone, so to sort of create a write primitive there. And trust zones should handle it, as I already mentioned, and how, how they should handle it. So we built a Pfizer to making sure that, to verify this, uh, this the, the flow which we saw previously um, uh, in IDA. So when, when you fuzz it, we saw that, yeah, they're checking this condition. So next vector which you can take a look is uh, race condition. So if the, if the structure is complicated, you may try to find some window between um, um, when they check the buffer and when they use the buffer, and then you can use that window, and from second CPU you can override that, that memory to modify the value. Because uh, trust zone not allowing you, not, not Requir requiring you to run all of the CPU inside the trust zone as SMM doing, this is a really applicable vector. You can investigate this small vector in IDA. We did it previously. Another vector, uh, really uh, new and ARM specific, is you point in the address, uh, but not to the trust zone memory. You point in the address to the um, MMIO of secure device. You sort of try to make a confused deputy attack when you uh, request in the trust zone uh, override the secure. The, the register on a secure device. Um, we built the Pfizer, run at it, and they, they check in this condition as well, so you cannot do that. Then we were thinking about, okay, what we want to overwrite, what, what, is, what is other vector is? And we were thinking, okay, let's find the hypervisor in the memory and try to override the hypervisor. We found hypervisor in the memory, and there's 10 minutes. Okay, uh, we find the hypervisor in the memory, and then we point in the pointer uh, to, the uh, to the SMC handler address of the hypervisor, and we overwrite it. It was, okay, that is good. Let's start, to, let's start to take a look deeply. And we were thinking, why we even can read the hypervisor from the kernel? It's not supposed to be there. We're not supposed to read it. We were thinking, okay, this is probably old copy. Before it lock it down, it's like some old, not use it copy. We just write there and the system is rebooting. Okay, so that's really hypervisor and we really overwrite it from the kernel. Okay, and our assumption was okay, if this has happened, the one single explanation is the stage two translation is disabled because if it will be enabled, we couldn't find even hypervisor and not read this hypervisor. And then we later on, we confirmed that this, uh, the source of the problem is the stage two uh, translation is disabled. So then from, from the kernel driver, you can override the hypervisor and, may, and install the rootkit to the hypervisor to make styles and, and hook all of the necessary interface you want. So that's, the, that's the, um, the flow for the attack. So we're going from the kernel to the hypervisor, then we're locking down the hypervisor so now it will be not accessible anymore from the kernel, and then we're allowing some uh, malicious application who know magic number to send the command to the hypervisor to read the kernel memory. So, so sort of backdooring uh, hypervisor we, and allowing some third, uh, some other application to have access to the kernel at any moment later. Uh, how are we doing this? Um, as I already mentioned, we are patching, uh, as I already mentioned, um, uh, the EL2 vector table we found that table previously, we patched this table. So we find some handler which is periodically calling like every two seconds. And we just, after we find this handler, we just patch the, our shellcode directly to the handler. Now every two seconds uh, we have our shellcode is executing. So what the shellcode is doing, it basically monitoring the memory, try to find the magic number. And after it find magic number, it basically execute the command which was passed with the magic number. And then the comment is kind of read uh, kernel memory. So user mode application want to read the kernel memory. Uh, with this, I will switch into the demo really fast. So we're checking that we're running in uh, Firefox Nexus. Then we're reading physical memory of the kernel. That the memory which we will try to read after we will uh, backdoor uh, our hypervisor through the application. Now we run an application which will basically store in the, the key, the, the, magic, the magic number in the memory and waiting until this command will be executed. And the command is read physical memory from the kernel. So now we run an exploit which is finding the exception table, uh, vector table, patching the vector table, 
And then we just waiting until our event will, will, will be triggered. And as, as the result, we will see that after we patch the hypervisor, hypervisor will find the command We'll find the command from the application and we'll execute that command. I don't know. Yeah, give me a second. Yeah. So, uh, so here it is. Uh, the, uh, the exploit uh, successfully finished. The code was injected. In a second, we see there is a command uh, was executed from the hypervisor and the command was sent from the user mode. So basically, we are, uh, as I mentioned, backdoored the the hypervisor to communicate with the user mode application and and send it and send the data uh, requ requested from the application and the data was the kernel memory that's that's sort of it so in this in the next generation in the google pixel they've sort of fixed it so they changed the architecture in a way that the kernel, the EL1, not anymore in TCB with the hypervisor. So basically, they just enable stage two translation, stage two translation table, and from there, the, the, the isolation was properly set. When you try to read the hypervisor in that uh, Qualcomm um, um, 2821 uh, uh, SOC, you will see that. Uh, the transaction is not going, uh, it's not passing through, so meaning that they are protecting it. And they also fix it, uh, the first vector which we was investigated previously when we pointing the pointer of the hypervisor to the SMC handler. They also fix it, this one as well. I think that was kind of sort of architecture fix. Um, conclusion. So first of all, there is still uh, some phones which has um, SOC Snapdragon 808 and 810, which is vulnerable to this vulnerability, to, to um, uh, make a, a rootkit inside your hypervisor. Uh, there is, uh, every time when, when we design the hypervisor, we need to make sure that uh, the TCB um, is set is really um, precise. You don't have hard uh, firmware that there, you don't have, uh, um, you don't provide the firmware accesses to the guest, you isolate the guest properly, you enable all the translation and so on. And third is, uh, there is a lot of common vector of attack in x86 and ARM, so we can reuse the security research to apply it and find the new vectors and new bugs. That's it.